Revelation 7, verse 1. After these things, I saw four angels standing at the four corners of the earth, holding the four winds of the earth, that the wind should not blow on the earth, on the sea, or on any tree. Then I saw another angel ascending from the east, having the seal of the living God. And he cried with a loud voice to the four angels to whom it was granted to harm the earth and the sea, saying, Do not harm the earth or the sea or the trees till we have sealed the servants of our God on their foreheads. And I heard the numbers of those who were sealed, 144,000 of all the tribes of the children of Israel were sealed. Let your eyes fall down to verse 9. After these things, I looked, and behold, a great multitude, no one could number, of all nations, tribes, peoples, and tongues, standing before the throne and before the Lamb, clothed with white robes, with palm branches in their hands, and crying out with a loud voice, saying, Salvation belongs to our God, who sits on the throne, and to the Lamb. Father, I ask you now to take complete control of my thoughts, Lord, of my words. Father, I pray for stamina. Lord, I pray for clarity. Father, I pray for strength for myself. Father, I pray against any distractions or disruptions, Lord, that, that Lord, we would hear from you this morning. So now, Lord, we just come around your table, your word to hear from you. And it is in Jesus Christ, our Lord's name that we pray. And everyone said together, the church is in heaven at this point. In the book of Revelation, chapter 7, the church is not on earth. That's the way I clearly see scripture, and I might be wrong on that, but we have been taken out, and now the seven-year tribulation, that is when God begins to shut down this earth, has begun. And it starts with the seals being broken, the four horsemen coming, plagues, famine, removing peace from the earth. All these things now are unleashed. And John is viewing things from heaven. And between the sixth and seventh seal, God wants to seal some people on earth. And that's what he does. And we read there in verse 7, after these things I saw four angels standing at the four corners of the earth holding the four winds of the earth that the wind should not blow on the earth, on the sea, or on the trees. And I saw another angel ascending from the east, having the seal of the living God, and he cried out to the four angels, and it was granted to them. Uh, he cried out, rather, cried out with a loud voice to the four angels, to whom it was granted to harm the earth and sea. He says, do not harm the earth, or the sea, or the trees, until we have sealed the servants of our God on their foreheads, and they counted 144,000 of all the tribes of the children of Israel were sealed. This word sealed is something that is found in other places in Scripture. We're going to come back to that because what God is doing is he literally, and you're going to see here is verses 5 through 8, literally he, he pulls um, 144,000 People from the 12 tribes of Israel, 12,000 from each tribe. Now, there's some confusion in some, some cults. Jehovah's Witnesses will tell you, well, no, these are actually the 144,000 that only they get to go to heaven, that that's actually what this is. That's not what the scripture says. Uh, just a very cursory interpretation of the Bible. He's clearly talking about that when the tribulation is going on, God is going to come down and he's going to seal 144,000 Jews who are in Israel. And what God is doing is he's fulfilling his promise to the nation of Israel. You see, guys, God's not, not finished with Israel. Israel is a center stone of scripture and prophecy. Now, right now, Israel, for the most part, is apostate. They've rejected the Messiah. But that was prophesied as well. How many of you know that? But then it's also prophesied that one day Israel is going to wake up and they're going to see the Messiah. They're going to realize that they were the ones who crucified him, that he is the Messiah. 
So God is going to keep his promise. So 144,000 Jews are sealed by God. God says, they belong to me, and now they have a mission. We're not told exactly what that mission is, but we can presume that their mission is to share the gospel because they're sealed by God. And 144,000 people in a nation of about six or seven million, that's a pretty good ratio. I think it's about one per 300 or, or so. So now they're going to be sharing the gospel during the tribulation that Jesus is the Messiah. He was the Messiah. And so now we see this unfolding before us. But just keep in mind that idea of being sealed. Now, two weeks ago, uh, the, the current administration came up with a peace treaty for Israel. And the Palestinians, or the Arabs, rather, Palestinians don't actually exist, they're Arab Muslims. The Arab Muslims, 94%, rejected it. They did a quick survey. And this is a peace treaty we've been talking about for some time here. It is a keystone to a cornerstone to prophecy. And that is that the Antichrist is going to sign or have signed a seven-year peace treaty between Israel and many nations, the Bible says. In fact, what it says is he will establish a covenant, re-establish a covenant. And interestingly enough, I was reading part of this peace agreement, and what the Trump administration has done is they've gone back to what's called the Oslo Agreement, which was a two-state uh, solution That is, the Muslim Arabs could have one state and the Jews could have their state. As of right now, the Muslim Arabs do not want Israel to have a state. They want to destroy Israel. That's why they don't want a two-state solution. But it was interesting to me that the Oslo Agreement, which was brought up a dec uh, decades ago, called for a two-state um, two solution. And, of course, in Daniel, it says the Antichrist will reestablish an agreement. So there was an agreement kind of made, but it was rejected, according to Daniel, and it will be reestablished. And one of the headlines in this peace treaty is, guess what? The Oslo Agreement. So here's the deal. If we as a country help divide or bring a peace treaty to divide the nation of Israel... God has made it very clear. He will not bless that. God mocks those who want to divide his lands in the book of Zechariah. He said, would you divide my land? Would you sell me for, for, like you would a, a manservant? Would you do that? It's my land. Don't divide my land. Now, it doesn't matter how much we built up our military it doesn't matter how sophisticated we are in our defense. If God's not with you, it makes no difference at all. It doesn't matter how many F-15s you have. It doesn't matter how strong you are. So we've been asked many times, where is America in, in prophecy? And you really don't see it. You really don't see the, uh, this great nation of ours in prophecy. So I don't know what's going on. Um, but this peace treaty is not something, if I had the president's ear, I'd say, sir, please do not do this. Do not divide the land of Israel. Have, have nothing to do with that. Everything else you've done with Israel has been great, but please do not do that. Having said that, let me put a footnote here. Um, after last week's teaching, we talked about the death of a nation and we made it very clear it was not a political thing. It's just simply a truth statement. I got a message from someone, and I, I want to address this message because it, it, I think it addresses really the lack of knowledge that Americans have concerning the quote-unquote church and government. First of all, um, in the 50s, uh, Lyndon Johnson got really ticked off because he was running for Congress, and there was a pastor that stood against him. And he said, you know what? We can't have these pastors getting involved in politics. So they passed the Johnson Amendment, which says if you're a 501c3 corporation, you're a nonprofit corporation, you cannot endorse a candidate. But you can speak about politics. You can, you can even uh, promote amendments. 
And this message I basically got was basically, you guys are going to lose your 501c3. You guys shouldn't be teaching about anything about the government uh, as a church. And I got to tell you, this last couple of generations have grown up with that lie. It's a lie. Because what that's doing is it's basically muzzling the church. You guys can't say anything about the government. Baloney. Baloney. That's what... That's what and the, the John, we're, we're not going to endorse any particular candidate, nor have we ever. But what we're going to do is we're going to tell you the truth of what's happening in our country. And we're going to compare it to God's word. With that, we are not going to compromise. We're just not going to compromise. So it's God's word. So, um, and, and it was kind of this threatening note, and I just, I just tried to gently tell this person that really you don't know what you're talking about. Sep separation of church and state. How many of you guys have heard separation of church and state? Do you guys know what separation of church and state is? Separation of church and state is the government shall not infringe upon the free practice of religion. Has nothing to do with the free practice of religion. The government is here to serve us. We don't serve the government, and the moment that switches, we're in trouble. So the church is to speak about righteousness. We are to point out that, that what's going on in our country. I want you guys to be, to be well-versed and have knowledge of what's going on. Who you vote for is between you and the Lord. I'm not going to tell you how to vote, but I am going to tell you the truth. So in that, we're not going to compromise. So the separation of church and state, people throw that around all the time. And, they, and frankly, and I say this with all gentleness... They're ignorant. They don't know what they're talking about. So if, if my faith is going to dictate what movies I go to, it's going to dictate certainly who I vote for. Okay? So let's sweep that under the rug now. Between the sixth and seventh seal, the sixth and seventh seal, God seals these 144,000 Jews. They are now, we presume, they're going to be representing um, uh, Jesus in, in, during the tribulation. And in verse 9, so in verses 5 through 8 is where you see he, he lists off all the, the 12 tribes and, and 12,000 from each tribe. That's 144,000. And then look in verse 9. After these things I looked and behold a great multitude which no one could number of all nations. Note that. Tribes, people, and tongues standing before the throne and before the Lamb, clothed with white robes and palm branches in their hands, and crying out with a loud voice, saying, Salvation belongs to our God who sits on the throne and to the Lamb. So we're in heaven. It, it, the, 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 the vision of the 144,000 are the Jews in Israel. Now the vision goes back into heaven in verse 9. John says there's this number, this great multitude that nobody could number from every tongue, every tribe, every standing before the throne, worshiping God, question mark. And then here we go, is class participation. How many here, everyone participate, how many of here have accepted Jesus Christ as our Lord and Savior, believe he died and on the third day rose from the dead? How many believe that? Guess what? This is you. Look in verse Verse 9, you're there. I am there. The, this great multitude is you and me standing before God's throne. So if you ever think, I'm not anywhere in the Bible. Oh, yes, you are. Verse 9. What they failed to mention is this little corner of this great multitude of Christians up in heaven. There's a, someone holding a sign saying, Calvary Chapel of Troy. Woohoo! That just doesn't say that. I'm just saying, didn't make it. But we're going to be there before God's throne, and you're going to probably hear Judy. She'll be here second service. You'll hear her screaming, Woo! Yeah, there's Judy, yeah! But we're going to be worshiping the Lord before his throne. This is amazing. And, and we're standing with white robes. White robes is Jesus' righteousness. We're clothed with him, and we're all saying salvation to our God who sits on the throne and to the Lamb. Salvation belongs to our God. Let's say that together. Ready? Salvation belongs to our God, who sits on the throne, who sits on the throne, and to the Lamb. That's what we're going to be saying. 
Now, if you let those words absorb into your heart and your spirit, they're so powerful, so incredible. Salvation belongs to our God. See, salvation belongs to him. He gives salvation to you and me. Then all the angels, verse 11, stood around the throne and elders and the four living creatures and fell on their faces before the throne and worshiped God, saying, Amen, blessing and glory and wisdom, thanksgiving and honor and power and might be to our God forever and ever. Then one of the elders answered, saying to me, Who are these arrayed in white robes and where did they come from? And I said to him, Sir, you know. So he said to me, These are the ones who come out of the great tribulation, washed their robes, and made them white in the blood of the Lamb. Now, verse 14 would seem to indicate that these multitudes from every tongue, every tribe, every nation. By the way, let me note this that you know, God loves every tongue, every tribe, and every nation. So what this seems to indicate is we get there. There's going to be Asians. I mean, I mean, look at the Chinese. God made 1.5 billion of them, so he must like the Chinese, right? So they're going to be there. They're going to be the Africans. They're going to be the Ugandans, the Sudanese, and some watched by Internet. There's going to be a different nation, Californians, <laughs> completely different nation. They're going, to be, they're, going to be not, they're going to be saying, cool, dude, cool. This is God's really cool. Anyways, there's going to be the Missourians. There's going to be the Missourians. We're just going to sit there and go right on, right? So every tongue, every so he's, they're all going to be there. And so worshiping God, and what it would, verse 14 would seem to indicate, although it wouldn't be accurate, is that this great multitude, which no one can number, they all of those came out of the great tribulation, the seven-year period. That's not literally what the, the Greek is saying. The tense of the verb is continually coming out. So what it, it also involves those who come out of the tribulation, but it's all those who've accepted Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior. They're coming out. They're worshiping um, God. It's a, it's a kind of a progressive verb there. It's, con, it's continually going on. Verse 15, now watch this. Therefore, they are before the throne of God and serve him day and night in his temple. And he sits on the throne, and he, rather, who sits on the throne will dwell with them. They shall neither hunger anymore, watch this, not thirst anymore. The sun shall not strike them, nor any heat. For the lamb, verse 17, is in the midst of the throne, will shepherd them and lead them to living fountains of water. And God will wipe away every tear from their eyes. Do you guys know that when our job is done here on earth, it's only begun, if you will, in eternity? We're going to be serving God. Now, there is nothing for me more satisfying, more wonderful than serving God. Do you know at our band of brothers... We get, up, we get there at 5.30 in the morning. I guess we had about 20 guys this last time. And then at Tuesday night, the Lord, the Lord really moved Tuesday morning. The Lord really moved Tuesday night. Let, let me share. Can I share with you guys what happened Tuesday night? This is so cool. We're getting together as a band of brothers. And we're talking about Joshua's camp. What's Joshua's camp? Joshua's camp is the once they were in the, the, the desert for 40 years, and they walked over in the the promises of God, the promised land, all the men of war died off. So now God needed new men of war. And what he did was he circumcised Joshua. God told Joshua, you circumcise these new warriors before you go to battle. And then the scripture says that they, they waited a few days as, watch this, they healed in the camp. And we're sitting up there. Now, now this, is, this is a microcosm of heaven. You have 32, 33 guys there who, they, they're, not there, they're not there to, to, to be entertained. They're not there to, to, to be noticed. They're, not, they're there to meet with God and with their other brothers. 
This is a precursor to heaven. And the Holy Spirit just begins to move. Those of you guys who were there, wouldn't you say amen to that? And we began to talk about how it is we brothers need to support ourselves because we want to become warriors in the kingdom of God. We want to become warriors for our family, warriors for the church, warrior for our children, warrior for our marriage. We want all these things and the Lord began to move and we just began to share, you know, how can we assist one another? How can we support one another? Because... Before we go to battle, God has to cut away. He's got to go to that secret place in our hearts, circumcision, that secret sensitive place in our hearts. And sometimes it hurts because we come to the Lord, we have wounds. We have things that have happened to us when we were young and we've got no place to take this stuff. And if we can't take it now to our brothers and seek healing and pray for one another, and I tell you what, the Holy Spirit just fell. <laughs> I felt it. I just sensed it. We broke up in groups, and guys began to just share. And I'm just going, God, you are so good. That's serving God. That's what it's like. And I tell you what, if that's just a taste of what heaven is like, I'm ready to go. When he's ready for me to go. I want to walk my youngest daughter down the aisle, then I'm ready. No, I want to see my grandchildren grow up and know the Lord, too. Then I'll be ready to go. But you guys get the point, right? So these fellowship times, this is what we long for. This is what we should be seeking. And so we see here that this fellowship, they're serving God day and night. No more thirst, no more sun, nor any heat. And the lamb is in the midst of the throne, will shepherd them. So this is very personal. The lamb is Jesus He's going to shepherd you and I in a very personal way. That's what this says. And lead you and me to living fountains of water. This is this idea of renewal, this new continual life. And he will wipe away every tear from their eyes. Very personal thing. Now, my grandson was crying not too long ago. And you know what I did instinctively as a grandpa? I reached out and wiped away his tears. It's instinct. Now, why do I do that? Because I love my grandson. Do you know that, G and it's a very personal thing. I mean, you, not anyone can just wipe away your tears. If you're sitting there crying and you walk up to me and I wipe away your tears, you'd be like, dude, what is up with you? <laughs> what? Right? I mean, only my wife can do that. I'd allow my grandchildren to do that. You know, maybe one of my kids, that would, that would kind of be weird, but that's okay. But if you came up and wiped away a tear, no. That ain't happening. God is so intimate with you and me that all the brokenness and loss that we've gone through in this life, and by the way, I think we're going to remember this life, but not the pain of it. I think we're going to remember things that happened in this life, but not the shame. I think we're going to remember this life things in this life, but not the guilt. I don't think our minds get erased. It's just the pain is taken away. Now remember, when Jesus gets to heaven, he has the wounds in his hands, his feet, and his side as a reminder, right? It's a reminder. So he wipes away all of these tears. Okay, so we know we have a purpose in heaven, right? We're going to be serving the Lord, but we have purpose right now. You're in the kingdom of God right now. And, and I probably should have started with the title this morning. Oh, we needed that up, gentlemen. Hearing God's voice. Hearing God's voice. What about hearing God's voice? As the 144,000 were sealed by God, so are we. And there's a, lot of, there's a lot of misnomer or misunderstanding about what it means to hear God's voice. So if we're going to be serving God in eternity, walking with him in his presence, but we also know we're in the kingdom of God right now, then how are we to get instruction here and now? Let's talk about the role of the Holy Spirit in our lives. So um, let's go to the first scripture there. Ephesians chapter 1, 13 and 14. Um, 
In him you also trusted after you heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, in whom also, having believed, says you were sealed with the Holy Spirit of promise, who is the guarantee of our inheritance until the redemption of the purchased possession to the praise of his, his glory. Now, when, when it, it talks about us being in heaven again, literally there, again, our position is in heaven. But now watch what it says here. There's 144,000 said, um, back in Ephesians, please. Um, 144,000 It says they're sealed with the Holy Spirit of promise. Do you remember when that scripture that says that the angels came down and sealed the 144,000? Remember that scripture? It said they sealed them. It's the same word. So what happened here in Ephesians is that the Holy Spirit seals you and I, but it says here with the Holy Spirit of promise. Now, if you look at that word sealed right there, what it literally means is a signet or a, a, um, a stamp. And some of you have heard this illustration before, but it, but it would have been so clear to those at Ephesus when Paul was writing this letter. And that is when you sealed something in Paul's day, you would use wax and you'd use your signet ring with, your, with your, um, the emblem of your family and you would stamp that, that uh, wax that, as it is drying and thus it would have your seal of ownership on it. And what they used to do was when they would, if they wanted to move like from Israel up to Rome or vice versa, they would send their belongings by sea and they would go by land because the Mediterranean Sea was so dangerous. Storms could come out of nowhere. So what would happen is they would go to Caesarea, they would have their stuff, their belongings in a box, they would melt wax on there, they would put their stamp of their, their family signet ring on there and then they would go by land, the cargo would go by sea, they would meet somewhere in Rome, and the way they would claim their property is, you would go to the dock, you would show the captain your signet ring or your stamp, he would go down below and he would match your belongings with the, those things that were sealed and he'd bring them up to you and they say, here they are. Well, Folks, don't, don't miss this incredible application here. You and I, when you place your trust in Jesus Christ, are sealed with the Holy Spirit of promise. God puts his stamp on your heart, on your life. He can see that stamp. And you and I are his property. But we're traveling through this world. And sometimes the Mediterranean Sea, this world, can get pretty boisterous. Sometimes the Mediterranean Sea, there can be huge storms. But know this, once we arrive at our docking, Jesus is going to come to, to the dock and he's going to claim you as his own because you have his stamp on you. Does that make sense to you? So this Holy Spirit of promise, this we are sealed. What's the next thing? Next scripture, please. John chapter 20, verse 22, we learn about the Holy Spirit. Jesus does this. He says, and when he said this, he breathed upon them. This is Jesus and said to them, receive the Holy Spirit. Now, this is interesting. This is in John. This is even before Pentecost. Jesus does what? He does what? He breathes upon them. He says, receive the Holy Spirit. He breathes upon them. So this is literally Jesus' life breathing upon his, his disciples. He says, now you receive the Holy Spirit. Now go to Pentecost. What happened when the Holy Spirit came upon the disciples? A great and mighty what? Brushing of wind. So what was that? Was it God literally breathing life into these guys? I think so. So when you accept Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, Jesus literally breathes new life into you. But this is different than Genesis. Remember when God created us. He created man and woman out of the dust and he breathed. Remember he breathed into their nostrils. Remember that? That's a different word, a different concept. That was the soul life. That's, that's life, but that's not the Holy Spirit. It's different. So everyone born or everyone conceived, is given that life from God. But we need to be born again. 
Let's go to the next scripture. In John chapter 16, verse 13. It says, however, when he, now he's talking about the Holy Spirit, he, the Spirit of truth, has come, he will guide you into all truth, for he will not speak on his own authority, but whatever he hears, he will speak, and he will tell you things to come. So now, you and I have the Holy Spirit, we're sealed like the 144,000, but with a different, with different calling than the 144,000, with the Spirit of truth, and he will guide you into all truth, for he won't speak on his own authority, but whatever he hears, he will speak, and he will tell you things to come. The spirit of truth. Okay, so now we get to the truth. What is the truth? Now watch this. What is the truth? What question do you have for God? What assistance do you need from God? What is it? Because he has it. He has it there for you. I don't know how to raise my children. The spirit of truth knows how to do it. Are you with me? I don't know how to love my spouse. The spirit of truth knows how to do that, right? I don't know how to act at my job as a Christian. I don't know what I should do. Where you're sealed with the Holy Spirit, Jesus is breathed upon you, and the spirit of truth is in you, and he's to guide you in all truth. So whatever guidance you might need, that's what the Holy Spirit is there to do. But I, I, I fear in the church of Jesus Christ, we haven't taught that. We've taught, you guys come in, let the pastor do all, and the staff do all the work. You guys just come in and be entertained. That is not the truth. That is not the church, rather, and it was never designed to be the church. Is that making sense? Do I have another scripture, Paul? Is there another one after this? No? No. Okay, don't go there just yet. So we want to talk about um, some things some things in following or hearing God's voice. Um, just seven, seven key points that I think are really important because what the Lord wants to do is he, he wants to speak to us and we want to hear his voice. So the first thing is this, hearing God's voice is I must have a desire, I must desire to have a life that glorifies God. So when we talk about Hearing God's voice, it has to start there. A lot of times when folks get into trouble as Christians, they've been kind of doing their own thing for so long, they kind of come to God, God and say, okay, drop it on me. Drop, drop the lotto number on me. Drop whatever on me, Lord. I, 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 need, I need an answer right now. And without a life that desires to glorify God, that must be tra the trajectory of my life in order to really get into this solidly hearing God's voice. That means I don't want my will, I want His will to be done. So when it comes to hearing God's voice, I've got to have an attitude of, Lord, I want you to use my life to glorify you. And that's setting up a heart that will hear God's voice. The next point. There are four sources of thoughts, and this is really important because how does God speak to us? He speaks to us, obviously, primarily through His Word. We're going to talk about that in a moment. But He speaks to us through impressions on our heart and our mind, and there are four sources of thoughts. Number one, my own thoughts, just kind of thoughts I have. i got to do this today, you know, this sort of thing. Simply random thoughts. What are random thoughts? Random thoughts. You guys ever just about to fall asleep and you have those really funny thoughts come into your mind? You guys, you guys, how many Beatles fans do we have here? Okay, we have four Beatles fans. Oh my gosh, I'm in the wrong church. <laughs> but uh, no, you guys, th there's a song called Yellow Submarine. <laughs> we all live in the yellow submarine. That was written because Paul McCartney was just falling asleep, and he said that, that a yellow submarine came to his mind, for which I've never forgiven him. But anyways, <laughs> it's just a weird song. But it's just those weird things that kind of come to your mind. Now, while I'm on the subject, um, simply random thoughts, um, some of you have mentioned about dreams, and we've gotten some questions about dreams and um, how do I know if they're from God, how do I know if from the enemy, how do I know if they're just from me? Just some really basic things. If you've ever had a dream, and I call them invasion dreams, 
where it's, you're dreaming and all of a sudden it's very demonic, it becomes very dark. Are you with me, church? You guys ever have those dreams? Okay. So you can tell if it's a demonic invasion, I call it an invasion dream, when they're not just kind of random experiences that you've had, because a lot of dreams are just about random experiences. I mean, I'm still having experiences about going to my finals in college. I'm still having uh, dreams about not remembering my high school locker number. Anybody else not remembering, or you show up to school and you've forgotten your football uniform or whatever, and you're just, just all those things. Those are usually just normal, but now if you have a dream, watch this, that's happening outside your normal experience. There's something maybe you've never seen before or experienced before, and it becomes very dark. A lot of times that's an invasion. That's a spiritual attack in your dreams. And you can actually deal with that in your dreams. I have. I've actually rebuked things and was like, whoa, that was, that was interesting. I don't know why that, how it is they get into the dreamscape world, but, but they can. So four sources of thoughts, my own simply random thoughts, the enemy and God. So Learning to hear God's voice, we're sealed by God. He has a purpose for us. Learning to hear God's voice, I've got to begin to distinguish between those four. Are they my own? Are they simply random? Are they they the enemy? And a lot of people will get confused with the enemy and their own thoughts. And and it'll, it'll come across something like this. I'm no good. I'll never amount to anything. God doesn't really love me. Um, he might love others. I'm not really saved. I've, I've sinned way too many times. You know, this Christianity stuff doesn't work. It might work for other people. It doesn't work for me. Anybody ever have those thoughts? Yeah, all of us. Would I be, on, would I be stating something incorrect if I didn't say all of us have had those thoughts before? Oh, this has got to be class participation. Can I get an amen on three? One, two, three? Okay, so now a lot of times folks will will confuse the two and they'll say, well, I'm having these horrible thoughts and, and I'll just need to be pointed out to you, no, those really aren't your thoughts. That's the enemy putting in your mind, but he'll put it in the first person. He'll say, I'm having this, or I, in other words, he won't say, you're no good, he'll put it into a thought in your mind, I'm no good, so that you think you're thinking that thought, okay? Or if it's God. So the enemy will come to steal, kill, and destroy. So I, I know that. So if it's, it's killing, it's stealing, and um, if, it's, if it's accusatory, if it's, if it's rushing me, if it's lack of peace, I know that's the enemy, or God's voice. So the third point, hearing God's voice, is I must grow in the knowledge of God's word or I can be easily deceived. So in growing and hearing God's impression on my heart, his guidance, I must grow in God's word. Uh, If I don't grow in God's word, you're going to easily be deceived. That's why a lot of teachers you'll see nowadays, um, a lot of teachers I think are false teachers, they'll camp on one part of God's word. They'll just stay there. They won't teach the balance of God's word and they, they get off because they emphasize this one aspect of God's word. The fourth point is you will make mistakes, but just get back in the game. So I may have felt like the Lord wanted me to do this. Okay, so maybe I got my, my voice confused with God's voice, but I stepped out and I did it and I realized, oops, I was wrong. But here's the thing, you're going to make mistakes. So if you feel like God wants you to do something and it wasn't him, he'll show you. He's really patient. But, but he does, listen, he does want us to obey. When, when he impresses something upon our heart, he wants us to obey. The fifth point is this. Make time for the quiet moments and hearing God's voice. He, remember, he said, be still and know that I am God. It's oftentimes during the real quiet moments, the Lord will speak to my heart. When I've really set aside time or I look into his word, I pick a portion of scripture in our daily light and I'll go through this stuff and God will just really speak to me. But, but you got to make time for the quiet moments. The sixth point. Ask the question, Lord, is there anything you want me to do? 
See, a lot of times I think we just kind of float around in this life not really purposefully asking God, is there something you want me to do? Now, if you ask God, if there's, do you want me to do something, how many of you guys know he's going to answer that? He's going to answer. The thing is, if I don't obey, and I found this in my own life, if I don't obey, then what happens is if that still small voice, that impression kind of starts fading away. But when I, the Lord puts something on my heart and I step out in it and I begin to obey, then it's almost like I can, I can now distinguish his voice even more and more. And, and I'm, I'm learning how to listen and I'm learning how, how, you know, how these impressions come. Is this making sense to you guys at all? So, so important. Now imagine you being sealed by God. You belong to God. He has a purpose for you in this life. Imagine if we were to whatever it is he told us to do, we were to do it. Do you know there's a lot of times when it says, Lord, is there anything you want me to do? Do you know there's a lot of times when I ask him that question, do you know what he has me do? Text my wife. Text my children. Tell them you love them. Tell them you're praying for them. And then he'll give, some of you guys get texts from me too. And some of you at three in the morning. And, and I'll just be, just, these impressions will just come. And I, you, can just, you just kind of sense these things. You know, it was, it was interesting. We had um, our grandson over. And um, he loves his Mimi. He loves his Mimi like you wouldn't believe. And it was time for him to go home, even, even though he spent all afternoon with us. And he's on the floor throwing a fit. A three-year-old, oh, I don't want to go home. I don't want to go home. And I'm in the other room. And my first reaction is when our kids, we didn't allow our kids to throw tantrums. We didn't. They threw a tantrum for .058 seconds. And, that, and I would come in and say, we're not doing this. You get up right now if they're old enough. And if you don't stop right now, you're going to get disciplined. It's funny because when I was back in the room, I'm hearing this. And by the way, you know what else he did? He went in our bedroom and locked the door. (laughs) And I'm like, JJ, open the door. No! JJ, open the door. No! I don't want to go home. No, he doesn't get tortured by my my son-in-law and my daughter. But I'm just like, no! Now, normally, I mean, I would be be like SWAT team when my... If my kids did that when they were younger, I'd be like... To the door and get down and hands behind. No, I, I just that's just my that's just the way I would think. But it's funny because I was going into that mode, and the Lord goes, No, don't respond that way. Don't. So I went to him, I said, Well, what do you want? You know, just talk to him. You, I mean, discipline, I believe in disciplining children. I totally believe in some children. Some children, I don't think you need to, but some children you need to just talk to him and listen to what he, listen to what he's saying. Listen to him. So he's behind the locked door and, and I unlocked the door. No! Unlock the door. No! I said, okay, will you come out and you can talk to Mimi about maybe staying? I lied. And then the door unlocks. (laughs) I didn't consult the Lord on that one. (laughs) Then we're in the car, and I'm ready to take him home, and he's still crying away, and he comes out, and he tells his Mimi, who's getting his jacket, Mimi, Papa said I could stay, ask him. (laughs) (laughs) Whoa! But here's the thing. I went, I was going full on combat mode with them. JJ, no, you're not doing this. And the Lord just said, calm, just calm yourself. So a lot of times if we just ask, Lord, how do you want me to handle this situation? How do you want me to do it? The final point, hearing God's voice, is this. Sometimes it's better to do nothing than something without God's leading. And that, you know, sometimes I'm the type of personality that I'm, I, I feel like I'm going to, you know, the Kentucky Derby, I'm put into that, what do you call those things you put the horses in? Little, little chute. And I'm sitting there, I'm just ready to go. I'm ready to go. I'm ready to go. And even if the Lord says, don't go, I ring the bell. And I'm going because I, I just, I want to be going. 
And I tell you what, I made so many mistakes that way where I'm just like, Lord, I prayed about it. I prayed about it now. Lord, lead me. I belong to you, and I'm not hearing from you, and you're not giving me direction, so I think this is a really good way to go, and that's a mistake. Does that make sense, church? So you and I are sealed with the Holy Spirit of promise. Jesus breathes upon us. We are in his kingdom, and he wants to speak to his children so he can spread his kingdom. Amen? Let's stand for a word of prayer. 